uh, with the Liaison Committee today. Uh, the committee is very grateful to you for uh, responding so promptly to the invitation that we sent towards the end of last week. And I'd like to thank the working group of members of the committee established by the whole committee that's helped uh, set this up very quickly. The working group has agreed the topics to be discussed and, the, um, and in consequence, the chairs who are representing the committee today. Uh, Prime Minister, the last time we had a Prime Minister before this committee was uh, 12 months ago. The committee agreed this session will focus on the coronavirus crisis, but there remain very many other policy areas, such as Brexit, international issues, trade agreements, other domestic policies that require cross-departmental scrutiny. So, Prime Minister, can I just ask you for a housekeeping point? Uh, can, can you commit to attending regularly this year and preferably uh, before the House rises again for the summer recess? Well, uh, first of all, Bernard, can I say thank you very much to you and to your committee for your invitation? And uh, I'm delighted that we're able to have this, this session. Um, uh, you're, you're very kind to uh, want to see me uh, again more, more frequently. Um, can I, uh, in spite of, even before we've uh, completed this one, uh, but can, can I possibly get back to you on that? Uh, obviously, there is a, a lot on uh, at the moment. Uh, we have a big a national campaign to uh, defeat the coronavirus, uh, get our country uh, back on its feet, uh, and uh, there's a huge amount of work that uh, we're involved in. So I'm sure your committee will appreciate that I, 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 my time is is scarce at the moment, but we will, will do everything we can uh, to oblige. Well, I, I note that's not a commitment, but I must uh, insist that that was a very, very strong message the committee wanted me to convey. I understand, and, I, um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. And the um, uh, colleagues have assured me their questions are going to be very short and to the point, and I would be grateful if you would confirm that you will give short and direct answers. I will, I will do my utmost, uh, Sir Bernard. And thank you for the advanced copy of the announcement uh, you're going to make in the committee. Um, uh, but without time to scrutinise it in any depth, the committee is concerned that it does not wish to be diverted from the questions we've got. And if your announcement is lengthy, uh, I'm afraid it will slightly lengthen the proceedings. Um, I just warn you of that. I'm sorry about that. But if you can keep your questions short, that will help us. Answer short, that will help us. Of course. The, um, I'll go straight in. Um, the committee... Um, is obviously extremely concerned about the issue of your senior advisor. Um, this poll suggests large majorities of the public believe that your advisor did break the lockdown rules. How much do you think this has undermined the moral authority of the government with the public at a time when public confidence in the government is so important? Well, Bernard, thank you very much. And uh, I, I wasn't going to make a, a, a long announcement uh, today about the, the test and trace scheme, uh, but I, I thought perhaps your committee would, would like to interrogate uh, me about it as, if they have a chance to, to read what we're doing. But to, on that particular matter, all I would say is that this has uh, really been going on for, uh, for several days now, and or in the media at least. And um, I, of course, I'm deeply sorry for all the hurt and uh, pain and, and uh, anxiety that people have been going through throughout this period. This country has been going through uh, a, a, a frankly most difficult time. We're asking people to do quite exceptionally uh, tough things, separating them uh, from their families. But uh, I, 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 m I must say that uh, I feel that from uh, my advisor to whom you re refer, we've, heard we've had quite a lot of autobiography uh, recently. Uh, I I've commented on it. I think people know my, my views. I really don't uh, propose to, to add to it. And I think what the public do want us to focus on, uh, Bernard, if I may, is I think they want us to focus on, uh, as far as we pos politicians possibly can, on uniting our message to get to, to, to your point and focusing on their needs and explaining carefully what needs to be done next to get our country through this epidemic. Uh, Prime Minister, you said on the 24th of May that Dominic Cummings had acted responsibly, legally and with integrity. Um, and that reflects that special advisors are bound by the section on integrity in the Civil Service Code. Why have you not invited the Cabinet Secretary to conduct his own independent inquiry in order to give you independent advice? 
Well, I do think that's a, you know, that's a reasonable uh, question to ask. But as I say, we've had a, a huge amount of exegesis of, uh, of discussion of, of, of what happened what, in the life of my advisor between 27th of March and the, and the 14th of April. And quite frankly, I'm not certain right now that an inquiry uh, into that matter is a very good use of official time. We're working flat out on coronavirus. Um, what advice have you sought from the Cabinet Secretary about uh, compliance with the code and uh, uh, that matter of integrity in the code? Well, I, I have no reason to believe that uh, there is any dissent from what I uh, said uh, a few days ago. Um, has he had an opportunity to ask his own questions of your senior advisor? Well, I'm not going to go into uh, the, the discussions that have taken place, but I, I have no reason to, uh, to depart from uh, what, I, what I've already said. Um, of course, it's, it is unprecedented for a special advisor to have their own press conference in the Rose Garden in Downing Street. Uh, how did you consult the cabinet before agreeing to this? Well, I, th I, I thought that uh, it would be a very good thing if uh, people could understand uh, what I had understood uh, myself uh, previously, I think on the previous day, about, about what took place. And... Uh, there you go. We 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 had a we had a long go at it, and yeah, look, it's been a very a very frustrating episode, and I understand why uh, why people are so uh, have been so concerned because this country is going through a, a, a horrendously difficult time. Uh, but I really think that you know, insofar as the what we need to do is to focus on getting the message right, which is I think, probably common ground with your uh, committee, then uh, I think what we need to do really is to, to move on and to okay. uh, get on to how we're going to sort out a coronavirus, which is really I think, the priority, the overwhelming priority of the people of this country. We have a plan. Uh, we've been going through it. It's working. Uh, we're now coming tomorrow, uh, the 28th of, uh, of May, okay. it's a very important next stage. Pete Wishart. Yeah, well, thank you, and, and a good afternoon, Prime Minister. And it's good to well, see you. Pete. The liaison committee, and for the first time ever. Can I just start by saying to you, I actually think that you've been quite brave, brave in the way that you've been prepared to sacrifice the credibility and popularity of your own government just to stand by your man. You, you've done something I've never seen done in the 20 years I've been in the House. You've somehow managed to unite a nation in condemnation and indignation over your handling of Mr Cummings. And as, as the chairman that alluded, 80% of the British public now think Dominic Cummings broke the rules. 63% said you should sack him. But the most worrying thing, Prime Minister, is 65% say his conduct makes it less likely that the public will now follow lockdown rules. Surely, Prime Minister, surely no man is more important than keeping this nation safe. Well, uh, uh, Pete, if I may respectfully say, um, uh, in addition to what I've already said about that particular matter, a lot of what uh, was written uh, and said over uh, Saturday and, and Sunday uh, was false uh, in respect of, of my advisor. It wasn't correct. And uh, I think that uh, he's had an opportunity to, to clear the matter up and uh, notwithstanding the various party political points that you may seek to to make, uh, I, I think the best, and, and the, your point about the message, uh, I, I respectfully disagree. I think actually the best way to, to clarify the message, the best way for, to, for people uh, to understand what we uh, need to do next is for us all uh, to move on and focus on what we're doing uh, tomorrow, but, what we're doing, what we're doing. You've made that point, Prime Minister. Sorry, Prime Minister. I mean, have you had a look at your inbox? My inbox, like MPs across the UK, is filled with people listing their sacrifices to follow the instructions that you set. I've had constituents who haven't been able to see their grandchildren and families for months. People not being able to visit dying relatives or attend funerals. You too. know what this looks like to them? One rule for those at the heart of government and another rule for everyone else. He won't say sorry, or you say sorry on his behalf. Well, I, of course, Pete, I am sorry for the, uh, the pain, as I say, the, the anguish and the heartbreak of so many people in this country. Uh, and by the way, there are, there are people across government uh, at every level 
uh, who have, who have been uh, going through exactly the same uh, privations and, and difficulties. And of course, we, we all understand that and, uh, and I share that. All I'm saying to you is that I think that what we need to, to do now as, as politicians, as leaders, if we possibly can, is to set aside uh, this row, because I'm afraid a lot of the allegations uh, turned out uh, to be totally false, and uh, to move on. Uh, I've said what I've had to say about that, that matter. Uh, I, I think that uh, insofar as it is correct to say that it is a, uh, a distraction, then by that very argument, now is the time to leave it aside and uh, move on. Point blank, Pete Wishart. But there's, this is just growing and growing, Prime Minister. The anger is reaching fever pitch. Writing this out just looks like petulant defiance. It's, it's almost Question, like you're now goading the nation. You know that eventually you will have to let them go. Why don't you now just get on with it? Anything well, to add, Prime Minister? Pete, thank you so much for, for your point. I consider that to be you know, very, you know, it's a, a valuable piece of, of you know, you're, you're making a, a political uh, point and a, a piece of political advice. Uh, I consider that this government, uh, what this government needs to do is is focus I don't uh, on the needs of the nation, on sorting out this problem and on getting our message across. And that's what uh, we're going to do. Stephen Crabb. You're muted. Good afternoon, good, good afternoon Prime Minister. Uh, you talk about the enormous national effort. You talk about the nation. But how frustrating for you is it that you, as the UK Prime Minister during this enormous peacetime crisis, the fact that we've not been able to act as one United Kingdom with one single set of clear rules, one joined up strategy? Or do you actually think that the variable geometry of a four nations approach actually ref reflects the strength of the union at this time? Well, um, Stephen, a really good question. And actually, one of the interesting things, uh, which you wouldn't possibly guess from my exchange just now with Pete, uh, which are, is, there's been fantastic cooperation, collaboration uh, between uh, all four nations of the UK. Uh, if you look at the, the differences between our approaches, they're very marginal. And to, to get to your point, it is very important that when there is a, a slight difference in the R, for instance, uh, between one part of the UK or another, or when uh, one of us has a, a slightly different problem with care homes, or uh, as we're seeing in, in Scotland or, or Wales, uh, it, it, is, it is entirely sensible that there should be slightly different uh, approaches, and that's indeed what we have, what we have seen. And, and if you see that in many, many, many European countries. Thank, thank you, Prime Minister. So can I ask you that on that point about collaboration? One sentence. How influential were the criticisms of the Scottish and Welsh First Minister about the easing of lockdown rules ahead of your statement on May the 10th? Did they effectively put a, a break or temper your own instincts to go further? Is that the reason why you gave a more cautious statement on that day? Are they having any influence over the Prime approach that you're taking? Well, Stephen, we all work together, and I listened very carefully to, to what Mark says to what uh, Arlene and Michelle said, what Nicholas says, of course we, we think about it uh, together. Um, actually what we said on, on May the 10th was a, was a pretty cautious uh, message. We decided to, uh, as everybody knows, to, uh, to, to have a, a, a relaxation that uh, encourages people who uh, must go to work for their job to, uh, to go to work. Uh, it's still the case that if you can work from home, uh, you should work from home, uh, but what we're, what we're also, we also brought in some relaxations on uh, on exercise and people's ability to travel uh, to take exercise. Only and, in England, only uh, in England. And, 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 and actually, um, I, was, I, was, I was struck by the, by the, the, con the congruence uh, rather than the disparity. I think it does, it sort of always um, suits those who, who have a separatist or uh, says, you know, uh, an agenda to break up the UK to play up differences when, in fact, uh, the uh, the unity has been much more conspicuous than you might uh, you might believe. Already four minutes behind, Prime thank Minister um, uh, Simon Hall. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Bernard. Prime Minister, um, do we not think, given the huge amount of cross-border traffic between the Republic and Northern Ireland, that we need to ensure that we are in as close lockstep as possible with the Republic? Uh, in order to ensure, as we take our baby steps to re to release lockdown, that the people, are, all of the people of the island of Ireland, are as safe as possible. 
Yes, absolutely, Simon. And I know that you follow this very closely from your uh, from your vantage point on the Northern Ireland uh, Affairs Committee. And I thank you for all your all your work there. Um, just just to say that what we're I, I have a very good uh, you know relationship, working relationship with Leo uh, Varagka, as as you may know. Uh, we talk uh, about what we're trying to do uh, together as much as as possible. One one interesting thing uh, is that uh, clearly. Uh, Ireland, the, the, the Republic of Ireland, won't be affected by any changes that we bring in on on quarantine. We'll keep the, the CTA, keep the common uh, travel area. So, uh, and as you, you know about the cooperation that's going on uh, with the app, so working together as closely as we possibly can. Thank you. If if the R rate starts to creep up, and lockdown needs to be replaced either as it is or maybe more full and robust. My inbox tells me that over the, that as a result of the last few days, the response of the British people is going to be far less energetic than it was first time round. And that is as a direct result of the activities of your senior advisor. You're right to say that we know what your views are. Frankly, Prime Minister, I don't think anybody understands why you hold those views. So what do we say to our constituents who are likely to say, you can keep your lockdown if it has to come back. If other people don't abide by it, why on earth should we? Well, Simon, I must say, I don't think that's true about how the British uh, people uh, will respond uh, to the next phases, to uh, how to work the test and trace system. I don't think that's uh, how they've responded at all throughout the crisis. Like they responded uh, with fantastic um, uh, responsibility and, uh, and, and, and collectively we've got that are down and got the, the incidence of the disease down. But if, if just suppose for a second that, uh, that you were right, uh, which I don't accept, uh, all the more reason uh, now for us to be consistent, clear in our message, driving those key messages, particularly about uh, washing your hands, maintaining social uh, distance, isolating uh, if you have symptoms, uh, all those things will continue to be absolutely vital as we move into the next phase. We're, we're, we're coming down, the COVID alert system, we're coming down from level four to, to level three. Uh, we hope we're going to be taking a decision uh, tomorrow, uh, but all that depends. Well, as, as you know what we're doing uh, with, uh, with schools, with non-essential retail uh, from June the 1st, uh, with, uh, with car showrooms, with outdoor shops, but all that depends on our ability to continue to uh, get the R done, and that means we've got to be ruthless in our message. Okay, thank you. Um, Meg Hillier, briefly. Thank you. Uh, Prime Minister, you said that a number of the allegations that are made about Dominic Cummings were false. You were with him for six hours. Did you see the evidence to prove that? Um, Meg, I, I, you know, I don't want to, to yes go Yes or into no, Prime Minister, it's a simple question. Yes, yes or did you to, see the evidence? I don't want to go into uh, much more and then I've said, it's a simple said question. Did you see the evidence? If, I will, if it pleases you, I will say yes, I did. But I don't want to. I don't want okay, to. Okay, well, if you say that's fine, I promise you, you saw the evidence. Would you agree that it would be a good idea for the cabinet secretary to see that or for it to be published? And then this problem might be off your table. Well, uh, I think actually that uh, it would not be doing my job if I were now to shuffle this uh, problem uh, into the hands of officials who, believe me, Meg, are, as I think the public would want, working flat out uh, to deal with uh, coronavirus. I, I think you've, everybody's had a... I, I know that there's a, there's a great political interest in this. I, I'm not certain uh, that... Uh, and I, I, I understand that completely, and I, and I, and I totally understand public uh, indignation. I totally understand that. But I, I do think that... Uh, as I understand things, and I've said what I've said uh, about the whole business, I think it would be much better if we could now uh, move on and yep. focus on the next steps. We must try avoid repeating ourselves. Yvette Cooper. Well, I don't know how, whatever, I, mean, I can ask the same question. What else can I do? <laughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. I have to say it is extremely surprising that you won't provide that evidence to the Cabinet Secretary or have any independent verification of it. But let me ask you about your instructions now to parents who either have COVID or have the symptoms of COVID who won't know 
how seriously they're going to get it and who have no local childcare available. Is the message to those parents now, the one from Jenny Harris to stay at home unless there's a risk to life, but if you do get ill, contact the community hubs? Or is it the message from the transport secretary and the community secretary to be able to travel to wherever you have a support network? In the words of Robert Jenrick this morning, if you don't have ready access to childcare, then you can do as Dominic Cummings did. Which is it? Well, I'm, I'm not certain, uh, Yvette, that there's as much of a, a discrepancy between those uh, two bits of advice as you as you suggest. And I think what Jenny uh, was trying to say was that uh, if you've got exceptional difficulties with, with childcare, then uh, you should take account of them. Okay, but these, we're not talking about exceptional difficulties with childcare. We're talking about the very normal difficulties with childcare. A survey from Mumsnet today found that a quarter of parents, a quarter of parents said they didn't have access to local childcare when they had COVID and were in exactly the same circumstances as Dominic Cummings. A third of them say they'd be more likely to break the rules now. So if you are trying to tackle local outbreaks and prevent them spreading, you need to be giving clear advice to parents. Yeah. And what is it? Because it is not clear to me from listening to Jenny Harris and to Robert Jenrick what that advice to parents well, who are in Dominic Cummings' Minister. situation. Oh, uh, the clear advice is to uh, to stay at home unless you absolutely have to go to work to do your job. If you have exceptional problems uh, with childcare, then that may cause you to, to vary uh, your arrangements, and that's, uh, that's clear. We're also uh, saying from uh, tomorrow uh, that, and this is an important development, that you, 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 there is a new test and trace uh, operation which will uh, change people's lives and which will require a great deal of thought and compliance, but which I think will be worth it uh, for the for the whole nation, and uh, the the fundamental advice remains absolutely uh, unchanged, which is uh, wash your hands, observe social distancing, and uh, self isolate well, if question, you have right? symptoms, and get a test. I'm asking specifically about your advice to parents who have COVID. Advice to I parents you are not giving the reason that you are not giving the reason you are ducking it the reason you're trying to I'm, not ducking. I just, I just, I'm not ducking actually i've just given i've just i've just, I've just said that i agree i don't think that i don't think that you're i don't think that you're actually travel across the country even though it may mean them having to go into a hospital somewhere else where they may see further infections do you want them to do that or do you want them to stay put when they don't have local child care like around a quarter of parents uh, Yvette, I think you'd have to look at each individual case and there were particular circumstances that uh, my advisor explained. Uh, I think what Jenny Harris was trying to say was that where there are exceptional difficulties, then people needed to, to take account of them. And, and uh, yes. other than that, I, I don't really know what I can add. No, here's the problem, Prime Minister. The reason you are ducking this is because the reason you're not giving people a straight answer is because you are trying to protect Dominic Cummings. The reason you've sent all of your ministers out to say fudgy things and unclear things is because you are trying not to incriminate Dominic Cummings and you don't want to apologise for him. The problem is that means you are putting your political concerns ahead of clear public health messages to parents who have coronavirus and the consequence of that is putting your political concerns above the national interest you are trashing in the words we have of a public question if i may say so i don't i don't wish to be uh, let me put this then let me put this to you as a precise question on the way into this crisis you were criticized for getting a whole series of messages decisions wrong on shaking hands on business as usual on letting cheltenham go have ahead a question please series of those things and 40,000 people are dead. We need you to get this right now. So can you tell us you have a choice between protecting Dominic Cummings and putting the national interest first? Which will it be, Prime Minister? Well, I think uh, my choice is uh, the choice that the British people uh, will want us all to make, Yvette, and that is uh, as far as we possibly can uh, to lay aside a party political point scoring and to put the national interest first and to be very clear with the British public about what we want to do and how we want to take this country forward. And uh, we come now to an important juncture where moving uh, to step 
uh, two of our of our roadmap. And I, I think that this conversation has, has, to my mind, illuminated why it's so important for us to move on and be very clear with the British public about how we want uh, to deal with that and how we want to make progress. And, uh, and frankly, when, I, when they hear nothing but uh, politicians squabbling and, and bickering, uh, it's, no, it's no wonder that they feel uh, confused and bewildered. It is much, much more important that we stress the vital messages, uh, stay at home if you can, go to work uh, if you must, though that will uh, change obviously for some, uh, for some sectors as, as June the 1st approaches and then June the 15th when uh, more non-essential retail comes on. Uh, we, will, we must have social distancing, it's absolutely vital, and really those messages need to be pumped out the whole time by you, uh, Yvette, just as much as me. Prime Minister, we would uh, love to have clearer messages. No, we, I need you to give those clearer we've messages. We've had a long time, Yvette. Um, we must move on. If, are there any other further questions? I'm obliged to ask the committee. You, you want to ask about the Prime Minister's advisor, otherwise we're moving on. Um, uh, Simon Hall, very brief, please. Thank you. Agree entirely with the seriousness of the situation, but I don't think anybody can understand why Mr Cummings is so pivotal to moving this country forward during dealing with coronavirus. This is now a distraction. People are very annoyed, Prime Minister. Is that on your radar? Well, I, I think, Simon, you've, you've made that point, uh, I think, several times now. And my, my respectful point to you is, yes, I do understand people's feelings. I do understand uh, why people uh, feel such indignation about the whole business, and the pain of the whole business of the, of the lockdown. But I really also think that what they want now is for us to focus on them and their needs rather than on a, a political ding-dong uh, about what uh, one advisor may or may not have done. And uh, to, to repeat a, a, an important point, which I don't think you've acknowledged, a lot of the allegations uh, that were made about that advisor uh, were simply not correct. And I don't think that point has been uh, sufficiently acknowledged. Right. We're moving on to science and health, um, unless there's anybody wants to carry on with that subject. Uh, right, we're moving on to science and health. Greg Clark. We're now quite far behind, I'm afraid. You're muted, Greg. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Good. Um, uh, Prime Minister, good afternoon. It's good to uh, see you back. Um, you've got a lot of scientific uh, advice. Uh, do you see it yourself? Um, I, I don't, uh, Greg, thank you. I, I, I don't, good to see you too. I don't actually read the, uh, the scientific papers except in exceptional uh, circumstances, but what I do get is the direct digest from SAGE, which, as you know, is chaired by Sir Patrick Valance and, uh, and co-chaired by uh, Chris Whitty. And uh, they give me the, the cream uh, of that advice. OK, so you get a summary. Um, from reading uh, that advice, can, can you explain why we have in this country a policy of two metres uh, social distancing when the World Health Organization recommends one metre? And countries that have a very good track record in uh, controlling COVID, countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, and Germany, uh, specify either one meter or one and a half meters. Well, look, um, Greg, I, you're making an a very important point, and one that I've, uh, I've uh, made myself uh, several times, many times in, in the course of the debates that what we've had. And, and, and uh, the, the advice from SAGE remains at the moment that there's a very considerable reduction in risk at two metres. Um, my own hope, and this is uh, where I hope we can get, I, my own hope is that as we make progress in uh, getting the, the virus down, in reducing the incidence, uh, that, that we will be able to reduce that uh, that distance and, uh, and which I think will be particularly valuable uh, on uh, transport and uh, clearly in the in the hospitality sector. In, in, so, but the, but the, the virus is um, international. The virus doesn't recognize international boundaries. Science uh, is international. Have you asked your advisors uh, why our specification should be the highest in the world? Uh, I have actually. What was the answer? And, uh, and, th and their answer is that they, they, that's what they feel is the is the is the right interval. Uh, that's why there's a difference. And uh, 
I, I can't, I, I can't, ex you know, I have, we rely and have done throughout on the guidance we get from uh, our uh, advisors. And um, that, is what, that is what they think is appropriate at the moment. But Greg, you know, that may evolve, as you know, Sage has changed its advice, for instance, on, uh, on face coverings. Um, well, advice needs to be uh, maybe uh, interrogated and uh, discussed, uh, Prime Minister. But um, uh, perhaps, perhaps you could ask Sage to to review the two metre rule uh, in good time for shops uh, and other places to consider their practice on the fifteenth of June and publish what they say, because this has a massive impact uh, on whether many workplaces uh, can open. Uh, would you make that commitment? I, I can not only I can I can not only make that commitment, Greg. I can tell you that I have already uh, done uh, just that. So uh, I hope that we can, I hope that we'll make, we'll make progress. Good. Uh, when contract tracing uh, is underway, uh, if you're phoned up and told to stay at home because contact. you've come into contact uh, with an infected person, uh, is staying at home compulsory, or can people use their judgment? No, it's it's uh, it's we want people to understand. Uh, that uh, this is something that is really not just good for for them uh, because they'll uh, they'll stop uh, you know, spreading the disease to those they might love and, and, and know, uh, but also uh, good for the. But whole is it compulsory or is it, um, it is it advisory? We, we we intend to make it absolutely clear to people that they must stay at home. But let me be clear, Matt will be. What do you mean by must? Is it is it is it, a, is it a law or is it advice? We will, we will be asking people to stay at home. Uh, if they don't follow that advice, uh, what we will be saying is we will consider what sanctions may be necessary, but uh, uh, financial sanctions or fines or, or whatever. But, but what- Of by the police or by civil authorities? Well, uh, whatever is appropriate. But, but what it's I would say- Monday, doesn't it? But, Prime Minister? What, whatever I, what, what I, no, because we're not bringing, we're, we're, to begin with, we're asking people uh, to, to do it as a matter of course. If they're contacted by an NHS tracker, a tracer, then you should, if you're contacted by an NHS uh, tracer and you're told that you've been uh, for uh, more than 15 minutes, less than two meters away from a, uh, somebody who has tested positive for coronavirus, then you should self-isolate. That's what we're we're saying. And you should advice. Should. You should. Now, um, if, 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 if people don't, um, if people don't, as I say, uh, we will we will consider bringing in financial sanctions. So, but fine. Now, last question. Uh, the reason, the reason uh, let me just ask um, one uh, wrap up, if I may, uh, Bert. Uh, do you have to uh, talk to the contact tracer? Have you got an obligation to do that? Uh, and uh, would it not be a good thing to be able to offer anyone that is contacted uh, an immediate test with rapid results uh, as conforms to international best practice, such as in South Korea, rather than advising them, as it seems, to lock themselves away uh, for 14 days, not knowing whether they've well, tested positive? Sorry, let's be clear. Sorry. I, but then, thank you, Greg. Um, uh, important point, clearly, if you are asked to, uh, to self-isolate and you develop coronavirus symptoms, you will, of course, uh, ha have a test. The difficulty... But what if you don't have symptoms? The difficulty with uh, testing uh, people uh, who are asymptomatic is that uh, they, they may very well uh, have the disease but not uh, test uh, positive for it for, for a long time. And... Uh, that can run right the way through, I'm afraid, for, for quite, a long, uh, quite a long period. So that's the difficulty uh, we have there, Greg, just too many false negatives. Now, a lot of people will listen to this and so say... So scientific advice, not capacity, that uh, is driving that. You've had advice that you shouldn't do that on scientific grounds uh, rather than capacity. That's completely right. And a lot of people listening to this will say, uh, um, uh, and this is a big, big change, right? And so people need to listen to this and understand. They will say, hang on a moment, you, you're telling me that uh, if somebody uh, from NHS tr tr Test and Trace contacts me and says, I've been, uh, I've been a, I've, I'm a contact of somebody who has coronavirus, I've got to self-isolate uh, for 14 days. I'm afraid the answer to that is, is yes. Uh, clearly, if they have a test and they test, and if they have symptoms and they test positive, 
uh, then they're out after, uh, then the, the, the self-isolation ends after seven days. But uh, if you, uh, if you, if you, I'm afraid if, you, if you're asymptomatic, uh, you don't have symptoms, then uh, you've got to do it. Now, people will say this is a, 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 gro a grave uh, imposition. And again, to get back to the, the conversation we've been having throughout this, this, this session, it is, a, it is a huge imposition. But um, it, it will be on a very small minority of the population, a very, very small minority of the population. And I would just say to everybody that it's, a, it's worth it because that is the way that other countries, that is the tool that other countries have used to unlock the prison, uh, to, to make sure that we can uh, go forward. And uh, so that captivity for a, a tiny minority for a, a short time will allow us gradually uh, to release 66 million people from uh, the current situation. So I do think it's the, the right way forward. Thank, Thank you, Francis. I think my time's Jer up. Jeremy, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Prime Minister, and uh, good afternoon. Today's mm -hmm. announcement on track and trace could be an absolute game changer, but it's only possible because we have massively ramped up testing. So I'd like to start by asking why it took until April to introduce the 100,000 test target, even though our first confirmed case was in January? Well, um, Jeremy, I think, uh, as you know, the, uh, the difficulty we faced when uh, we, this virus, we had several difficulties. First of all, this was a totally new virus and it had some properties that we were very, everybody was quite slow to recognize across the world. For instance, uh, it, is, it is possible uh, to transmit coronavirus when you are pre-symptomatic, when you don't have symptoms. Or, or when, uh, or when, uh, and uh, I don't think people understood that to begin but with. What, what was the reason our, for the delay, our, Prime our Minister? Testing, our testing operation, as you know, uh, began much earlier. We did have a test, track and trace operation. But unfortunately, uh, we did not have the capacity in PH, in public health England, uh, to be absolutely blunt. We didn't have the enzymes, we didn't have the, the test kits, we just didn't have uh, the volume, uh, nor did we have uh, enough uh, experienced uh, trackers uh, ready to mount the kind of operation that they did in uh, some other uh, Eastern uh, Asian countries, for instance. And I think the brutal reality uh, Jeremy, is that this country did not learn the, the lessons of uh, SARS or MERS, and we didn't have a, uh, a test operation uh, ready to go on the scale that we needed. Uh, we now have that, and uh, as, you will as you'll appreciate, during the, the peak of the epidemic, when, we, when numbers of cases were running uh, very high indeed, uh, test, track and trace would not have been appropriate. It's now the appropriate solution. Prime Minister, my, re my question was really why we waited from January to April before expanding that capacity. But one of the consequences of that is that we couldn't test everyone who is being discharged from hospitals. Did you get any advice that doing that meant we could risk spreading the virus into care homes? Uh, no, and as, as you know, um, the, a, a, a huge effort was made to uh, try to protect care homes. and. Um, uh, don't forget that, uh, as, as, as uh, Chris Hobson as, of NHS providers has said, uh, every discharge from the NHS into care homes was made by clinicians who, and, and, and in no case was this done when uh, people were suspected of being uh, coronavirus victims. Uh, and actually, the, the number of, uh, of, of discharges from the NHS into care homes uh, went down by by 40% from, from January to, to March. So it's just, it's just not true that there was some concerted effort to uh, move people out of, the NA, out of NHS beds uh, into care homes. That's just, that's just not right. No, but there is obviously risk if you can't test people when they leave hospital. And countries like Germany insisted that care homes quarantine people arriving from hospital, and, and we didn't. Now, just on to today's announcement, which is so important. Uh, you said you want a world-beating system. And most people think that Korea and Taiwan are amongst the places that have done this best. But in those countries, the test results are returned within 24 hours. With us, it's 48 hours, twice as long. And that means that the people who are contacted because they've been near someone with coronavirus have longer 
to spread the virus to others. So why don't we get our test results back in 24 hours? Well, uh, Jeremy, it's a very good question. And actually, we are uh, reducing the, the time, the, the delay on getting your test results back. And I really pay tribute to Dido Harding and her, her team. Uh, the UK is now testing more people than any other country in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, she has put on, she's got a staff now of 40,000 people, uh, 7,500 uh, uh, clinicians, 25,000 trackers in all. And uh, they are rapidly trying to accelerate the, the turnaround time. Uh, I, 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 will, I will send you the latest figures uh, after this meeting, but uh, we're, we are reducing the delay uh, the whole time. And it, uh, I understand that. Hours, a, 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 bit, a chunk of them are already uh, within 24 hours, and that chunk is growing. I understand that, but I've got three care homes just in my constituency that have had to wait more than a week to get their results back. And isn't the truth that actually turnaround time is just as important as the volume of tests. So why don't you as Prime Minister just say, this is a public health emergency, I want all test results back within 24 hours, because that would galvanize oh, the system and make the test and trace system work much more effectively. Uh, well, we have done that, and that's, that's exactly what Dido- What, you've introduced uh, a 24 hour target? Yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, okay. and that's, that's her, that's her um, that's her goal, and if you talk to both the Dido and uh, and to Chris uh, Witty, the, the the CMO, uh, the Chief Medical Officer, you know they would agree strongly with you that the quicker the turnaround time, uh, the faster you can check whether someone actually has a coronavirus, the more effective your uh, test, track, and trace operation is going to be. And when have you told them they have to meet that twenty four hour target by? I'm not going to give you a a, a, a deadline uh, right now. Jeremy, because I've been forbidden from announcing any more targets and deadlines. But, but give me a sense. I, I is, will, it, is it I in will. the next week or is it going to be, you know, in the next month? Give me a sense. Are we talking weeks or months? It's going to be as soon as possible. Weeks or months, Francis. Perhaps I could just say one thing that might be of use to, to Jeremy and the, to the committee, which is to understand where we are with test uh, and trace. Um, tomorrow, and I, we must be absolutely clear about this, I'm not going to pretend to to you, uh, Jeremy, or, or to the committee, that this, what we will have tomorrow uh, will be valuable, it will be useful, it will be a, a very important tool in our fight against uh, coronavirus, but it will be getting steadily better to become a truly world-beating test and trace operation in the course of the next days as we go through, as we go through June. This, is, this, has got up, this has gone from a complete standing start uh, to a, a huge operation. And so, Jeremy, I don't want to give you a, uh, a an exact deadline for when we'll get down to, uh, to 24 hours, uh, but that is plainly the ambition. We'll do it as soon as we can. Okay, a final brief question, Prime Minister. Um, like us, uh, Canada, Israel, and Singapore all have a lot of agency workers working in their care homes, and they've banned them from working in more than one care home because they don't want agency workers to spread the virus from care home to care home. Will you look at doing the same thing here? Not only that, that Jeremy, but we've done that already because what we've said, uh, if you look at our care home action uh, plan, uh, what we said was we were going to stop the movement, the migration of, uh, of workers from one care home to the next because plainly that was what was happening. You were seeing uh, outbreak after outbreak because staff were moving from, particularly in chains of care homes, from, from one to the next. So that, is, that has been put a stop to. And that's why the number of outbreaks in care homes has, has gone down from uh, in the hundreds uh, a, a few weeks ago to seven or eight uh, a, a day uh, today. And that's why the number of deaths in, in care homes has, has now come down so, so dramatically. Uh, I, I, like, I'm not going to pretend that this has been anything other than a, a tragedy, an absolute tragedy, uh, what has happened in uh, care homes. But um, the, the Care Home Action uh, Plan, including the measure that you've just described, uh, has already had a, uh, a, a very, very uh, powerful impact. Thank Can you. I just interject, Prime Minister, that what is causing the delays to tests? Uh, how are you resolving those problems and who's in charge of implementing uh, th that resolution? Okay, uh, the, the, the delays to testing 
are caused very largely by difficulties in the labs uh, with uh, actually producing the results in a speedy and, and effective way. And we've had problems with some labs I'm not going to, uh, to mention by name that haven't just, you know, things have fallen over in their, in their operations. They haven't been able to get the results back fast enough. Uh, and so we're working on all sorts of uh, solutions, including uh, batch testing uh, and other uh, other faster methods of, of testing that I'm sure the committee are already uh, familiar with, pregnancy st style tests and uh, and so on, in order to to speed it up. So uh, there have been a host of uh, of technical problems, but notwithstanding those problems, uh, the UK is now uh, testing capacity is 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 now up at about 100. That's very helpful. Thousand. We'll stop there. That's very helpful. Um, and we're going to go up to 200. Five though. minutes. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Prime Minister, um, good afternoon. Um, afternoon. You mentioned that this whole system of testing, tracking and tracing was from a standing start. But already in this country at the beginning, we have a lot of highly qualified professionals called directors of public health, who are experts in the field uh, of, of contacting people, tracking and tracing. Why were so many of them last week saying that their involvement in designing this system had been minimal? Well, Clive, you know, that's one of the issues that has been that I've, I've raised uh, repeatedly and has been raised uh, repeatedly with me, uh, a, a strong desire to have much more uh, local expertise and, and use all the local uh, knowledge uh, far, far more effectively. And uh, one of the reasons why uh, one of, we decided at the heart of uh, Dido's operation is the chief executive of Leeds uh, Council. I'm sure you uh, know who who is uh, helping to to make sure that we you know we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, we are using uh, local experts, people who understand uh, their communities uh, as well as uh, recruiting uh, more trackers from uh, from around the country. Well, I say it seems to many people that the the involvement locally was almost an after. To thought. So we're now going to have this grand national system, Department of Health's involved, the, um, the Public Health uh, England are involved, we've got phone banks, we've got an app eventually. Um, how will the local arrangements that you just described, the involvement of Directors of Public Health, fit into that? And who in the end will be accountable for the whole system? Well, I, I will be accountable for, for everything, but the person... So we can blame uh, you for everything that goes wrong then, Prime Minister. I, I, in my experience, it's very, it's very hard to avoid uh, blaming quite right too. But look, uh, Dido is, is leading it, and she's doing a, a very good job. Of it. And, uh, and I thank her and her team. She, you know, they've got a standing start, 40,000 people. Well, let's go on a little bit, because I think uh, the government have now announced that there will be, um, every area will have an outbreak control plan, an outbreak control committee uh, who will be responsible for that plan. Uh, precisely, uh, who are these committees? Who's going to form them? Uh, and if there are going to be local lockdown measures, which have been referred to recently, will it be the local committees that decide on those and impose them? Um, thanks very much, Clive. You know, what we will be, um, obviously, we'll be working with the, the local uh, outbreak committees and the, the, those responsible for, for dealing with whatever happens locally will clearly uh, go through the local uh, resilience uh, forums, which are, which are leading on this. But uh, there will be strong uh, directional uh, effort and control uh, from uh, the, the joint biosecurity centre that we are now setting up. And, um, you know, uh, members of the committee will be familiar with this change. We're, we're moving to a, uh, a, a we're going to have much, much more uh, observation and detailed uh, knowledge of what's happening. So in those local teams. committees are responsible to the Biodiversity Committee at national level. That's it. That's, That's how, it. How it um, works. That's it. And the, the Joint Biodiversity uh, uh, Biosecurity uh, uh, Centre uh, will uh, be looking at, for instance, the, the other day uh, you saw there was an outbreak in, uh, in Western Supermare and um, uh, we moved very quickly to, to close things down there to try to, to sort it out. That's the kind of uh, whack-a-mole uh, tactics that we're going to use as we keep driving the virus down uh, and keep uh, reducing uh, the incidence. It, it, it's, it's very, very important that we have a, a very sensitive uh, test, track and trace operation right. in order to cope with local outbreaks. Right. Can I just follow, it refers to a question that Greg Clark asked earlier. 
Uh, I understand there probably are long-standing sanctions for people who don't isolate with um, a, a disease which is uh, notifiable uh, under the public health rules. Directors of public health seem to understand that. But what is missing, Prime Minister, is that if someone is uh, infected and then is asked for information about the people they've been in contact with, I understand there are absolutely no sanctions if they refuse to provide that information. Isn't that, well, a, major, I, isn't that a major hole in the system Prime that needs addressing? Thanks, uh, uh, Bernard and, and, and Clive. Yes, you're you, you're totally uh, right that this is a, a something that we're relying on people's uh, public spiritedness, on their willingness to cooperate and defeat the disease. And uh, I have to say that in other areas of uh, very delicate, very sensitive areas, uh, where uh, where people uh, do need to give details of their contacts, such as uh, HIV uh, transmission, it does work. So, Clive, I am confident that it will work in this case. But if it doesn't work, will you look at sanctions then? Because this yeah. is maybe something that we need to do. Well, uh, obviously, we're relying very much on the, the, the common sense of, of the public to, to recognise the extreme seriousness of this. This is, this is our way out. This is our way of defeating the virus, getting our country back on its feet. And I think people will want to work together. I think most work, people will, Prime Minister. It's those that won't that we have to deal with, surely. Correct. Clive, you're correct, and that's why I said uh, what I said earlier on. I think to uh, to to Greg uh, that we would, uh, we, we of course we would keep sanctions on the table, and as we as we develop the system, uh, we will review constantly uh, what kind of a cooperation compliance we're getting. Thanks. Thank um, you, Bernard. Um, point well made, Clive. Thank you, um, Prime Minister. Can you just explain who Dido is? Uh, um, who is she? What is her role? Just for okay. the department to understand. Uh, Dido Harding is a, is, a, is, a, is a senior executive in the NHS who's crossed over to, to work full time now on bringing together uh, across departmentally and uh, across all the institutions involved, whether uh, Public Health England or the uh, or care homes or, or whoever it happens to be, uh, the test uh, and trace operation. So she is responsible for NHS test and trace and uh, that's what's being launched uh, th this evening by, uh, by Matt, and that's what goes live tomorrow. Very good. We will now move on to uh, uh, reopening of schools. Robert Halfon. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can you assure all those parents, children, teachers and support staff who are watching today that the phase school opening on the 1st of June is absolutely safe, is of minimal risk, and that all the required testing, tracking and tracing will be given to teacher, staff and pupils, and there will be the required PPE where it is needed. Um, and is it still the government plan to have uh, primary, all primary school years going back a month before the summer holidays? Okay, Rob, well, there's some very, good, very important questions. Um, just to remind everybody, because, you know, not everybody would have clocked this yet, uh, what we want uh, from June the 1st is for uh, primary schools to be, begin gradually to go back. So uh, early years, uh, reception year one and, and year six, uh, we know we can do it in a safe, uh, socially distanced way. That's what we want. We accept that uh, not everybody will necessarily uh, go back uh, on day one, but we do expect uh, people to return uh, to school for in, the, in those class groups. Um, we do believe it's, uh, it, it's safe, provided, provided everybody remembers the, the guidelines that we've set out and everybody understands the crucial things you've got to, to do, particularly uh, maintaining social distance and, and washing your hands. Those are the absolutely, uh, and, and of course, self-isolating if, you, if you've got symptoms. Uh, those are the crucial things that you've got to, to, to do. They can't be stressed often enough. Um, uh, and on your point about the rest of primary school, Rob, um, uh, we want to keep that under, under review. Uh, we'd like to do it if we can. It depends on our national uh, success in keeping the disease under control uh, and uh, driving, that, uh, driving that incidence down. And, and so we'll, we'll continue to, to review it in accordance with the scientific advice. Mr. Halfon. Uh, thank you. We know that uh, roughly 86% uh, of vulnerable pupils are not uh, at school and learning. And a survey of 900 heads 
in England suggested that around 700,000 state school pupils are not doing any uh, schoolwork. There is a potential decade of educational poverty in the offing and possibly a safeguarding crisis. So will you support a catch up premium supported by a volunteer army of retired teachers, graduates and charities alongside opening of summer schools to help those left behind children catch up with their education and get much needed pastoral and well-being Prime support? Minister. Yes, um, I think, Rob, the short, the short answer is I want to support any measures we can to level up. You know what, what, what we want to do in this in this government. And there's no doubt that there's a huge social injustice taking place at the moment uh, because <clears throat> some kids are going to have better access to, uh, to tutoring, to, 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 to schooling at, at home, and other kids aren't going to get nearly as much. And that's not fair. And that's one of the reasons why we need to get schools back. And I think that's something that uh, people in this country do understand. They do understand the basic uh, social uh, injustice there. You've got lots of good ideas there. Uh, the the catch-up fund um, uh, making a particular effort to, 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 to tackle the needs of disadvantaged kids. Don't forget that we're already uh, making sure that uh, children from disadvantaged backgrounds get uh, laptops and, and tablets and, uh, and routers uh, where, where necessary. But uh, I, I agree with you that there's a lot more that needs to be done. Mr. Halpern. Thank you. Um, on uh, apprenticeships, the starts have fallen by 7% on last year. Uh, we know that significant amount of apprentices are being furloughed or being made redundant. We're in danger of destroying our dream of building an apprenticeship uh, a nation. Will you consider introducing a apprentice a guarantee offering every young person from the age of 16 to 25 a guaranteed apprenticeship providing they get the qualifications from level two right up to degree level uh, well rob I'm, I'm i'm going to all i will say to you is that i totally agree that apprenticeship is going to play a, a huge part in getting people back onto uh, the jobs market and uh, getting them into into work and uh, we will look at anything to to, to help people, uh, it's going to look. It's going to be uh, a, a a difficult time, but there are also great opportunities uh, to give people skills now uh, that uh, they perhaps uh, need and haven't been getting uh, uh, over the last few years. So we're going to focus on that as well. But why not give them an apprenticeship guarantee? Because there will be a lot of people looking, young people needing skills and jobs in the aftermath of the coronavirus. Well, we will be doing absolutely everything we can to get people into jobs. And uh, if it, uh, I will look at the idea of an apprenticeship uh, guarantee. Uh, it's, it's, I suppose it's something that you, we'd have to work with employers to, uh, to deliver. We'd have to think about the funding of, of that. But, you know, this is a, a government that has done some pretty astonishing and creative things uh, with helping business in the last uh, few months. And uh, that's the kind of thing we could, we could well consider. We're, we are going to need to take exceptional steps uh, to help our young people into work and and we will finally um finally i've got very, my very brief please yeah i've got my question which have been guaranteed by you mr uh, chair that uh, cambridge university is set, uh, become the first university to announce it's moving all its lectures online until summer 2021 yet uh a, another university, Nottingham Trent, which ha is an award-winning university, is going to have blended uh, mix of campus and online learning. Should higher education follow the example of Cambridge or Nottingham Trent? And can I just finally ask, should yeah. every student who's working in the NHS during the coronavirus have their tuition fees reimbursed this academic year at the very least? OK, Rob, you're, you're piling on the uh, some... some uh... Some some questions here uh, on 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 your on your final one. Um, uh, I, I I will come back to you uh, on uh, on NHS uh, students or students who, who are working in the NHS. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll give you an answer as soon as we possibly can. On your point about Cambridge and uh, a Nottingham Trent University, um, obviously I think. Um, it's a matter for universities, but uh, clearly, uh, I, I think the implication of your question is that face-to-face -face tuition is, is preferable, right? Uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I hope that all universities understand that and uh, and see that that's uh, also important for uh, for their students and and for, and for social justice. Thank you, um, Mr. Stephen Timms. Thank you, Chair. Can I pick up that social justice point and ask a, a question about a a couple in my constituency? Uh, they both work, they have two children, 
the husband's employer didn't put him on the job retention scheme, so he has zero income. His wife is still working, but her income is less than their household rent. They have leave to remain in the UK, but no recourse to public funds, so they can't get any help at all. Isn't it wrong that a hard-working, law-abiding family like that is being forced by the current arrangements into destitution? Um, hang on, Stephen. Why, why don't they? Uh, why aren't they eligible for for universal credit or, or for employment support allowance or uh, any of the well, other? It's, it's, it's a very good question. It's me. because they have no recourse to public funds. That's a condition that's attached to their leave to remain. They've ah. been here for years. Their children have been born in the UK. But because for a 10 year period, they have this no recourse to public funds, they, at the moment they can get no help at all. Where, where, are, they, where, where are they actually from? The, the couple I'm thinking of are from Pakistan, but it applies right. to anyone okay. uh, from um, outside the, the yeah, UK. I, 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 and, and, they, and they can't get furloughed, obviously. obviously not. Well, look, I'm, I'm going to have to come back to you on that, Stephen, okay. uh, because, you know, clearly they're, they're, they're sh you know, people who, uh, who've worked hard for this country, who live and work here, uh, should have a support of one kind or another. But uh, you've raised a very, very important point. If people's con the condition of their leave to remain is they should have no recourse to public funds, uh, I, 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 will, I will find out how many uh, are, there are in, in that position, and we will see what we can do uh, to help. I, I, I'll be most grateful. The, the Children's Society said, I think, two weeks ago, there are at least 100,000 children in families in exactly that position. They've got leave to remain, they're law-abiding, uh, they're hard-working, they've got no recourse to public funds, and many of them can get no help at all at the moment. So I'll be very grateful. I'll, I'll, I'll be very we interested. Look to, I'll, I'll uh, we look forward to a letter on this matter, Prime Minister. Mr Timms. You will get it. Thank you very much. Can I raise a, a separate point, really picking up Robert's point uh, about a, a proposed apprenticeship? guarantee. I just want to point to the, the success of the, the Future Jobs Fund after the last crash in supporting young people back to work. I wonder whether you'd agree that we are going to need some pretty radical measures to tackle unemployment after the crisis, particularly to support young people who everybody, uh, I think, is suggesting are going to find it particularly hard to, uh, to get into work. Yes, and that's why I think the idea of, of uh, the, the Rob's idea, this apprenticeship guarantee, is so attractive because uh, what you know, what we have done is we put our arms round round every worker and and help them keep their, their job. But uh, businesses, are, you know, they may be they may need support in uh, in the in the in the coming months as they get back on their feet uh, in taking people on, and so we'll need to think about how to how to help them. And at the same time, look, let's face it, this country uh, does have skills uh, deficits. We do have a productivity gap still. This, this might be the moment, uh, Stephen, when we really start to try to, to tackle that and address some of the, use this crisis to address some of these issues. So you, I can assure you that uh, the Chancellor and I and everybody, we're, we're looking at all this, this stuff very closely and we'll be wanting to uh, come forward uh, in, in June, uh, early July, with, with much more about how we get uh, employment going again, how we get the economy uh, restarted. But for now, it's very important that we focus on defeating this virus. Okay. Uh, after 2010, the last crash, we had a, a, an ambitious large-scale employment support programme. Of course, for the last few years, unemployment has been low, employment support has been much more modest. I wonder if you'd recognise that we are going to need, again, and perhaps this is what you've just been suggesting, we are going to need, again, a much bigger employment support programme after the crisis than we've had in the last few years. I think it's it's very likely, Stephen, and uh, you know we've done some things that I think have been have been right and uh, and, and have been uh, overdue. I mean, the, I think lifting LHA local uh, housing allowance uh, up to to thirty percent again of, of rent of of uh, of market uh, of, the, of the local market. I think that's the right thing to do. <coughs> Forgive me. That helps a lot of people. Um, what we've done with uh, with universal credits also been uh, important, but this is going to be a, the, the challenge now is going to be about getting the economy moving again and creating jobs, uh, high class jobs, good jobs uh, for the whole country. And <coughs> forgive me, um, 
my mantra remains that the way to do that is with fantastic infrastructure, better education, better skills and technology. We're going to stick ruthlessly uh, to that. And indeed, uh, just so everybody, I said this before to uh, conservative colleagues, but I'll say it to, to everybody on this committee, uh, we're going to double down on that program. We, 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 we want to intensify that. <coughs> the, uh, it's going to require as well, I think, support for people to get into employment as well as making sure there are jobs there. And the point made forcefully to our committee recently has been it takes a good year to get an employment support programme into its stride. So I wonder whether you'd agree it really is very urgent to get a programme planned and, uh, and underway. Uh, yes, though, though, don't forget, Stephen, uh, what the uh, what HMRC has already done, what the government has already done at incredible speed in getting the furlough programme going. Nobody thought we could do that thing uh, so fast, uh, and they did. They did it very effectively. Uh, so um, I think one, one of the ways in which this country is getting uh, easier, as it were, to help, where, where people are getting easier, we do have so much more uh, data. We understand where people are, what the problems are one of the things that we're using to tackle this this epidemic so uh, I hope that we'll be able to be uh, very fast in in dealing with the the, the economic issues uh, on the spot as as we uh, are trying to, to to deal with the, the the health and the medical issues right now thank you Let me move on now thank you very much uh, Caroline notes you're self-muted at the moment, Caroline. I've unmuted. Uh, we've heard about the phase school opening, and that's going to happen at a similar time to the retail sector opening up, where we know nearly 60% of employees are women. Whose advice have you taken, Prime Minister, on how that phasing <clears throat> and the availability of childcare might impact women's ability to get back to work? Um, well, as, as I say, uh, I'm pleased that... Uh, I, I think you'll... Your, your, your question, Caroline, is, is, is uh, directed at whether or not we've got a, a sufficient, uh, sufficiently female um, representation at the, at the top of government, you know, helping us to inform these decisions. And I really think we, we, think we have. You look at, um, the head of policy in number 10 is Munira Mirza. The, the uh, election manifesto on which we both fought uh, successfully was written by uh, two, uh, two women. And... Um, the most important appointments we've made just in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, whether it's uh, Dido Harding or, or Kate Bingham, uh, who's running the vaccines operation, have also been uh, have also been women. So, okay, can I just interrupt you there, Prime Minister? The EHRC have said that they've been ignored by Downing Street and that you've not listened to any of their advice on the unequal impact of COVID. Which experts are you listening to on the impact this virus has had, particularly on female employment? Well, um, we are, there's a, a, a general study uh, being conducted uh, across Whitehall about the, uh, the inequalities aspects of, uh, of COVID, uh, and uh, that will be reporting to me. There's a study on the medical uh, inequalities uh, that uh, Professor Fenton uh, is, is producing, uh, and that, will, that should report by, uh, by the end of this month. The Institute for Fiscal Studies said that women are more likely to be furloughed or they're more likely to be in sectors where uh, they've been shut down. They're also worried about the availability of childcare and their employers making decisions for the future based on which employees might have those challenges. You said that you hoped employers would be considerate, but that doesn't give any legal protection. Do you think optimism is good enough? Uh, no, I think it's very important that... Uh, people are given the, the, the protections that they that they need, and uh, we will. You know, I think the, 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 it's true that more women uh, have been furloughed, but it's also true that the furlough scheme is more generous uh, than virtually any other scheme around the world. And I can't think of any other country uh, where people have been given eighty percent of their uh, of their wages at up to two thousand five hundred pounds uh, per month in the way that uh, the UK uh, has done. And we will continue uh, to look after people, uh, to put our arms around uh, our workforce, to help them back into work. Uh, and, and, I, and Caroline, your, your point about uh, the particular vulnerability uh, of female workers is, is very good because female, female workers, uh, women workers, you know, they find they, I think they have been harder hit by this thing because very often uh, they will have jobs, uh, particularly lower paid jobs, that make it more difficult 
difficult for them uh, to work from home. And uh, that's why we need to uh, get this thing moving if we possibly can, uh, keep fighting the virus, uh, keep defeating it and help people get back into work. We went into this crisis with record female employment. That's a fantastic achievement. But in order to come out of it with women being able to go back into work, we're going to need a childcare sector that's functioning. What specific <clears throat> thought have you given about additional assistance to the childcare sector? Um, well, uh, we've already uh, invested uh, considerably in supporting childcare, as, as you know. Uh, it was in our, uh, and, and we, will, uh, we will do uh, whatever it takes to help uh, women get back into work. And I, look, I, I think, I agree with you, childcare is absolutely critical for the success of our economy. Specifically, how has the Government Equalities Office contributed to the decisions about which parts of the economy should open up first? Uh, Caroline, we take uh, every decision uh, with, uh, you know, full uh, consideration for uh, the equalities impacts, as, as you'd expect, that any uh, government department, any government does these days. Thank you for that. Can I you just... Common... Certainly, Bernard. Uh, after you, sorry. No, no, I just wanted uh, to know, uh, the Prime Minister commented earlier that he felt there had been enough female voices in the decision-making processes. Why have they not been more visible? Um, well, I look, I mean, uh, when I said, uh, I, don't think, I don't think I said enough, by the way. I just said that there'd been a, there'd been a lot. Um, so, you know, I, I think that uh, it's certainly true that I would have liked to have, ha I'd like to have had uh, more female representation in the, on the, on, in the press conferences so far. Uh, we've had, uh, Jenny Harris has been mentioned, uh, Pretty has done a few. Uh, we, will, we will do our best, uh, Caroline. And, um, you know, uh, what can I say? You made the distinction, Prime Minister. Dido will be appearing uh, this afternoon. Can I just ask you, how much do you think uh, having women in the room when decisions are being made actually changes the nature of those decisions? I think you, I think you make a huge difference, a huge difference. Uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I may, that may sound like a vaguely sexist thing to say, but it's very important. <laughs> Prime Minister, you made the distinction between there being a lot of women and enough women. How many is enough? Oh boy, <laughs> this is a deeply that's a, that's a question on which I'm not confident to pronounce. Is uh, it not fifty percent? Uh, it's well, not a joking matter, though, is it? It's, it's not, and uh, I, all I say, uh, Caroline, is that uh, it's incredibly important to us. Incredibly important to us. Uh, as as conservatives, and uh, we have we have more. Uh, Fifty percent would be great. Uh, we have we have large numbers of uh, female MPs of great talent, including yourself, in uh, in the House of Commons now. More than uh, far more than I, I believe. Think we, made we, the we point, Prime Minister. And we have and never forget. It's only the Conservative Party that produced two female Prime Ministers. Okay, well, we might start from that. Maybe, maybe, Don't maybe, best you'll be, maybe you'll be the third. Thank you very much, Caroline. Thanks, Bernard. Um, Prime Minister, we're moving on to the final group of questions. And in many respects, they're the most, the economy is the most important issue because that's what's going to make the difference between people living in misery or prosperity as we come out of this. So I very much hope you will afford us a few extra minutes so that we can get these very important questions in. I will be extremely yeah. grateful to you. Mel Stride. Thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Prime Minister. Um, Prime Minister, in your uh, response to Stephen Tins just now, um, in terms of addressing the importance of getting unemployment down as we come out of this crisis, uh, you referred to your mantra and you referred to doubling down, basically on spending on training and apprenticeships and infrastructure, etc., all of which I think are important, incidentally. But you've also said in the past that austerity is not something that we're going to get involved with. And yet, what we do know is that the structural deficit will have increased very significantly as we come through the other side of this crisis. And whilst we may be able to borrow at low rates for some time, that will be predicated on a clear and credible plan that the markets believe in for getting that structural deficit down. Given your stance on spending, that means significant increases in the overall tax burden 
in this country, does it not? Uh, well, Mel, I think you're, I, I, I understand exactly where you're going with your question, but I think you're just going to have to, to wait and if, you, if you can until uh, we've, uh, till Rishi uh, Sunak, the Chancellor, brings forward his, his various uh, proposals. And you make an important point about the, uh, the potential this country has uh, to borrow at good rates and to, and to invest in, uh, in infrastructure, amongst other things. Uh, we, we didn't have to wait, though, Prime Minister, when it came to basically saying there will be no return to austerity. Uh, in other words, that spending at pre-crisis levels will be broadly maintained. So what is your statement now on taxation? Is it we'll have to wait and see what the numbers look like? Or is it, well, you can give a similar assurance that, broadly speaking, taxes will remain at the same kind of level as they uh -huh. were? I, I think I think I, I would share your your instincts, Mel, to try and keep taxes as low as we conceivably can, consistent with uh, the our desire to invest uh, in our in our fantastic public services. And but I, look, I don't want to I don't want to um, anticipate what we're going to now what we're going to do on uh, on our economic package. That's that's for that's for a bit later on. If I may say so, just you know, Bernard said just now that. The most important thing was the was the economy. Um, yes, of course, but we won't have a strong economy uh, unless we can get uh, coronavirus under control, uh, unless we can continue uh, with our roadmap and defeat it. And that is, I think, what we should focus on right now. OK, can I just zero in on, on, on one particular group that are being particularly damaged by the economy? And they've already been referred to by Rob, and that's young people. There's no doubt they are bearing the brunt and in terms of job insecurity, job losses, the effect on their, uh, um, their lifestyles and living standards and, and so on. And we need to do a lot, as you've recognised, to support them as yeah. we come through uh, this crisis. Now, at the same time, if we go back to spending, one of the big spending commitments that uh, you have in uh, the manifesto here is the triple lock around pensions. And in fact, as an MP that represents an elderly constituency, if I may put it that way, I think that's very important. But can you today give us a categorical assurance that that particular manifesto commitment will be met? We're going to meet all our manifesto commitments, uh, you know, unless I specifically tell you otherwise, Mel. Uh, the manifesto you and I fought on uh, is, and, 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 and it's an important point because we won't be blown off. Of course, we will uh, deliver. 40 new hospitals. We're well on. We're well on track to delivering 20,000 uh, more police officers. Uh, uh, we will recruit 50,000 more, more nurses, and uh, heaven knows the need for those nurses has never been uh, more apparent to to our country. Uh, we're we're going to get on. We're going to get on with our program, and or, you know we we've got a fantastic agenda for this country of uniting, leveling up, and what I, and that's not that's not just what that means. Is but I want to keep it to the tax. So just so we're very clear, no rises in income you're, tax. You're, 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 uh, yeah, hi, um, uh, uh, Mel, I think when you, were, when you were doing your job, as you did, did it so well uh, in the Treasury, I don't think that you would have uh, made that to made any kind of commitments, uh, fiscal commitments on, uh, in this kind of committee. Uh, but uh, you know where my instincts uh, lie, and they're, and they're very much the same as yours. I was just picking up on, on that we will meet our manifesto commitments, which includes no increase in the rates of those particular taxes. They're very broad based and heavy lifting, and that's quite a commitment to stick to if you're also uh, not, not prepared to bear down on spending to at least uh, some degree. Could I just ask a final question, which is firstly to say, I think broadly the Chancellor has done a very good job actually in terms of stepping in and supporting the economy through this very difficult uh, period with the furlough scheme, et cetera. But inevitably, by moving at such scale and at such pace, there have been gaps. And one of those relates to the self-employed who work through their own company and take self-employment income by way of a dividend. And that currently is not being allowed to contribute to the assessment of the amount of furlough that they should qualify for. HMRC say it's too complicated to do that. I suspect it's one of those areas that a hand reaching down from the top, such as yours, Prime Minister, could slice through the Gordian knot. Are you prepared to personally have a look at this and potentially help hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hardworking, self-employed uh, people with their furlough? Yeah, I, I, thanks, Mel. Look, I really do understand the, the needs of the self-employed in, in this time. It is, it is, it is tough. Uh, you're making a very good point about uh, those who, uh, who who get uh, income by way of a, of a, di a dividend. Um, 
uh, we will look at that, whether that can be uh, set against the furloughs, which I think what you're uh, proposing. Uh, again, I think that when you look at uh, in the run of what the UK is doing to look after our employees um, and, and self-employed, uh, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty awesome package. Um, uh, and we mean it, but uh, this particular, um, uh, this particular uh, extra cash I will, I will have to discuss with my friend next door. I'm grateful. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, right. um, moving on, Darren Jones. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Prime Minister, how much of the British economy do you expect to end up in some form of state ownership as a consequence of Project Birch? Well, um, I, I can't give you uh, a figure on that, Darren, but suffice it to, to say, I mean, getting back to what Melvin, this is, we're going through quite extraordinary uh, economic times. And uh, no, I, I, just... I understand, I understand, Prime Minister. I don't want you to repeat the answers you've given to my colleague, Mr. Fine. Stride, because of, of time, but to, to maybe extend the question for you, uh, could you give us an idea about how the government will prioritise support across different sectors? Will Airbus or McLaren, for example, get different support to, say, the hospitality and tourism sectors, or will they all get the support that they need? Uh, we, will, we will do, Darren, whatever is appropriate to, to each sector. Yeah, with, Prime Minister, Prime Minister what, what is appropriate? appropriate. Not, That's my question. I'm not, I'm not going, I, can't, I can't give you a, a hierarchy. Okay, uh, my second question, Prime Minister. Um, at what level of unemployment do you think it's right for the government to intervene to provide pay or secure work for people after furlough payments have come to an end? Well, we're, we're going to do everything we can to get everybody, uh, Darren, back into work. Thank you for that answer. And uh, to build on Mr. Stride's question, the self-employment income support scheme comes to an end this weekend, whilst furlough for employed workers continues until October. Why is that? Uh, well, we will, uh, as, I, as, as we said, as, as I think the Chancellor said, uh, when um, uh, we announced the, the, the scheme for self-employed people, we will uh, keep it uh, under review and, and we will do what Prime we can. Prime Minister, it's this weekend, it's this weekend that that income gets cut off. But People will have forget, a lack of income from next week. Don't forget that uh, uh, self-employed people uh, already uh, have the uh, access to bounce back loans uh, and they, uh, I think the last figures I saw were uh, 15 billion has been uh, been lent on the, on, on the bounce back loans. Income tax payments uh, can be deferred uh, till uh, till next uh, till next year, uh, and uh, people are, are of course uh, eligible for all sorts of other government support, including the more generous universal credit that, uh, uh, and other things that I've already mentioned. Prime Minister, universal credit is not generous, and uh, it's unfortunate that you don't have an answer for those in self-employment whose income will be ending uh, this weekend. Uh, Prime Minister, these questions were tried, trying to get an idea of the scope of the government's ambition for supporting businesses in the economic recovery, and I'm afraid that your answers haven't been um, particularly um, instilling of, of confidence. Businesses, workers, unions and consumers will need to see that from you in order for them to return comfortably to work, school, or the high street, will you be bringing forward a full economic recovery package to this committee and to parliament before the summer recess? Uh, you, can, you can take it, Darren. Uh, I, I must say I respectfully disagree with what you said about uh, this government's economic uh, package for this country. I don't think there's any other country that has done anything like the furlough scheme. I think uh, that even your colleagues on the, on the Labour benches would accept that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's generous and it's, and it's, and it's right. Um, uh, and yes, in answer to the short answer to your question is yes, we will be uh, bringing a a full uh, coronavirus economic post corona uh, economic uh, recovery package uh, to 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 you and and to everybody else in in Parliament. We look forward to that, Prime Minister. And just to clarify, I wasn't criticising the economic package. I was just highlighting the lack of confidence from the public in the government in lifting the lockdown restrictions. My last question, very briefly, Chair. Uh, earlier in the session, you said to my colleagues uh, that the allegations against Mr Cummings were untrue. Could you set out specifically for this committee which allegations specifically were untrue? Well, I, I've, I've gone into that before and I have really uh, no, uh, nothing to add on what I've, I've previously said. You didn't answer the question today, though, Prime Minister, about which allegations were untrue. Would you like to take this opportunity to do so? I, 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 tell, you, I tell you why I don't uh, want to go back into that, Darren, which is, as I said, I think repeatedly uh, to other distinguished members of this committee, uh, it is my, my strong belief uh, that although um, uh, you know, I, I, I understand uh, people's uh, frustration, people's indignation uh, with the, the whole business, 
I, I believe me, I do. Uh, I think that what the country wants is for us to be focusing on uh, how to go forward on uh, the test and trace scheme that we're announcing today uh, on how we're going to protect their jobs, uh, their livelihoods, and defeat this virus. And that, I think, is where uh, the energies of all politicians of all parties uh, should now be directed. Well, thank you, Prime Minister. I'm grateful to your commitment today to bring that post-COVID economic package to this committee before the summer recess. We look forward to seeing it. Thank you, Chair. Thank well, you. I, don't know, I don't know if you were getting it exclusively, Darren. <laughs> I, 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 That's what you said. That's what you said, Prime Minister. It's on the record, and we look as forward members, to seeing as it. As members of the House of Commons, uh, you will be the benefit. You will get it. But I'm not. I, I, I can't, I'm not promising a world scoop. To, to the liaison committee. Uh, well done, Darren. Thank you for your questions. No, 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 Darren. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Prime Minister. Uh, with oh, regard to quarantine uh, for yes. those coming into the UK from the 8th of June, can I ask you why now, when we're easing the lockdown and other countries are ending quarantine, and why not when we entered into lockdown? Uh, First of all, second point uh, first, the, the reason we didn't uh, do it then was because the scientific advice was, was very clear that it would make no difference to the, uh, to the arrival of the, uh, of, of the epidemic, or vanishingly little uh, difference to the uh, arrival of the epidemic. It might delay it by a bit, but it would, it would still come. Uh, the, the, the reason for doing it uh, now is because uh, across the world, uh, we're seeing uh, the... Uh, it, infection rates come down, they're coming down here in this country. What we don't want to see is reinfection from, uh, from abroad. And uh, we think a sensible quarantine scheme uh, can help to, uh, help to prevent that. And that's what we're going to do from June the 8th. Prime Minister, many have commented that a sensible regime would look at the countries and their R rate. And if it's below ours, then there should be no need for quarantine. Whilst that may not be possible for the 8th of June, will that be possible for the next three week period, which is the 29th of June, to allow those buying cheaper flights for their summer holidays, which have gone on sale today, uh, to uh, be removed from the threat of quarantine? Yes, uh, absolutely, Hugh. We're, we're, we want to make sure that uh, we use the three week reviews to, to be sensible, to, uh, to, to we want to you know, drive the R down as fast as we can in, in this country and to have a, a, as a sensible a quarantine scheme as possible uh, to keep flows as, 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 as generous as we can. What will have to change between now and the 29th of June for these air bridges to be accepted? Uh, well, we'll have to agree them with the other countries concerned, uh, but we'll also make, have to make progress on our uh, in tackling the disease, and, and we'll have to have evidence that the other countries are, are in as at least as good a position as we are. But that looks positive. What looks negative uh, are those workers in the aviation sector, and I know British Airways, many of whom will be in your constituency, who um, are under the threat of not only losing their job if they retain it, having their terms and conditions slashed. Prime Minister, can I ask you, why is the furlough scheme called the job retention scheme when companies like BA can put their employees on furlough and then put them under threat of redundancy at the same time? Can this be changed? Well, um, look, I be perfectly frank, I am concerned. I won't go into individual companies, but I am concerned about the way some companies are, are treating their, their workforce. And uh, you're, you're raising a, a very important point. Uh, Hugh, I want to see, you know, the, uh, this country is nothing without its, its workforce, its labour. Uh, we've got to look after people properly and um, we will, and, and I, I'm, I'm well aware of some of the issues uh, that are, are starting to, to arise. People should not be using furlough uh, to, you know, just cynically to, uh, to, to uh, keep people on their books and then, and then get rid of them. Uh, we want people back in jobs. We want this country back on its feet. That's the whole point uh, of the furlough scheme. And Prime Minister, you'll be aware that uh, Willie Walsh, uh, the chief executive of IAG, has tried for years to slash the terms and conditions of his staff, has failed because the staff have had enough power. They don't, don't have the power now. Is there something the government or parliament can do to step in to stop this action before it occurs? Look, Hugh, I, I, I'm, I'm aware of this uh, issue and... Uh, it's we're actively looking at uh, what what we can do. I'm grateful. Thank you. 
Um, uh, Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee has a supplementary question. Muted, Meg. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Prime Minister, you've been very clear throughout that uh, you want to be focusing on the agenda that you said, and I quote, you want to be very clear about what we want to do. You want to stress the vital message, stay at home if you can. And obviously this is vital for the economy to get back up and running. So are you concerned now that the message during lockdown was so unclear that your own advisor did the right thing, but the rest of us didn't understand what we could do? Uh, no, Meg, I think that the message uh, during lockdown was, was very clear. And uh, people who uh, had the, had the uh, virus, including uh, my advisor, isolated uh, for 14 days. People stayed at home. Uh, and, Prime Minister, uh, well, Prime Minister and you say this, but we've all, result, all been result, contacted result, by result many of people who've been living in very difficult circumstances who didn't know they could do what your advisor did. And if that's the level of clarity of the message, aren't you concerned that going forward, this is going to cause a real problem as you expect the economy no. to get back up and running? And I think that the most important thing now is for everybody to focus on uh, the, the next steps and uh, for everybody to look at the test and, and trace scheme. Uh, probably it won't affect you. You probably won't be contacted. But if you are contacted uh, and you are told that you've been in contact with okay, someone. Well, Prime Minister, that's a different thing to my question, so perhaps the chair, it's not really answering my question, but Prime, back to the chair. And Meg, if, you, if you're saying that the message was uh, so unclear, uh, or is so unclear, I, I really dispute that. Actually, we're, 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 I'm looking at the figures every day, we're seeing continual uh, compliance of, of a fantastic level by the British public, because they understand, we all understand, right. that defeating this virus requires common sense and it's working and it was thanks to the British public uh, working together that we prevented the overwhelming of the NHS and I remember I was looking back at my notes for, for early March we were terrified that we were going to run out of ventilators the, the NHS would collapse that didn't happen because people right. followed the right. well, Prime Minister I mean my question was about the clarity of messaging going thank forward you. Uh, thank you um, can I, uh, Yvette, if you've got one sentence, I will forgive you. Very quick follow-up to the question from Hugh Merriman about the decision not to have quarantine at the borders in the early stages of the crisis, Prime Minister. We were at, we always heard from Patrick Valance, who said many cases came in from Italy and Spain during that period. And we were told by Professor Wilder Smith that between 1,000 and 10,000 people with coronavirus came in in that period. You still haven't published the scientific advice that you were given for that decision. Will you now publish that advice, please? Uh, yes, and I think what Patrick has said is that um, all the advice is, is from SAGE is going to be, to be published, including the, the SAGE Minutes, Yvette. And, you know, I just go back to, to what I said in answer to, to Hugh about um, the, the decisions going into the, to the, to the, the virus, I mean, the, the, the epidemic, um, on, on, on quarantine, on closing, uh, borders. Don't forget, Italy uh, closed its border completely uh, to China and yet had a, uh, an appalling outbreak. Uh, our advice was that, th that this was that all it would it would achieve very little by way of epidemiological protection. Uh, it, it could only uh, delay, uh, and uh, that there were there were other reasons why uh, it was <laughs> essential. Uh, uh, Yvette, I'm sorry, um, uh, but Prime Minister, did you finish that point? Yes, and, and there, were, there were reasons, for instance, uh, for repatriating UK uh, nationals, for making sure that we had access to, um, uh, to medical supplies from overseas. Uh, we needed uh, to keep uh, aviation going. But, you know, uh, Yvette, people will study all these decisions. Uh, I, I'm sure they will, and, and uh, maybe they will uh, find fault with them, but I can tell you they were taken uh, in good faith uh, in the, in the, with, with the intention to defeat the virus uh, and save lives and they were on, on the best possible scientific advice. Uh, Prime Minister, may I just ask, how will quarantining not retard the recovery of the economy? Well, uh, I, I hope it will not retard the uh, recovery of the economy, Bernard, by preventing a, a helping to prevent reinfection, which could lead to a, a second 
uh, outbreak and uh, the R going over one again uh, in such a way as to do uh, serious economic damage to necessitate uh, another another lockdown. That's the that's the logic. But you understand the the, the conflict. Um, uh, may I just raise two points from absent colleagues? Obviously, we have had far more demand to be in this meeting than we could accommodate. Uh, Julian Knight, the chairman of the DCIS committee, particularly concerned about the hospitality industry and charities, yeah. which we haven't had time to address. And, and what? And charities. Charities, yeah. Um, uh, uh, what, what can you say to about the hospitality industry and charities? Well, I, I, uh, on the hospitality, um, uh, Julian uh, should know that we're really trying to go as fast as we can. Uh, it, it is very difficult to, to bring forward hospitality um, measures in a, uh, in a way that is um, socially, uh, involves social distancing, um, but I'm much more optimistic about that than I was. Uh, and I think that uh, we may be able to do things uh, faster than I uh, I previously thought. Charities, I think we put uh, 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 very uh, 750 million pounds from my memory to support the charitable uh, sector uh, during what is obviously a very very tough uh, time, and we'll be trying uh, to help them. And the, uh, the chair of the defence committee laments the sense that there is uh, a capable HQ for this crisis where. Well, I would suggest that there needs to be constant reviewing and learning in a, on a comprehensive scale. Um, it, it seems to take a long time for lessons to be learned and things to be changed because such an HQ does not exist. What would you well, say to that? I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think that uh, actually uh, what we've now got in uh, here in in, uh, in number 10 is uh, a, uh, an operation, a COVID response operation led by Simon Case, who's very distinguished uh, civil service, but I'm sure be familiar to, to the committee. Uh, he's looking not just at the health aspects, but at the economic recovery aspects as well, bringing it together uh, across Whitehall. And uh, obviously, uh, we have, a, we have a, a structure that you will understand the, the various ministerial groups uh, that, that work towards uh, the, the decisions that we, we take. When we, we take these decisions every, every morning, every, there's, a, there's a meeting uh, here at, uh, at, chaired by me. Uh, we have uh, all the key players. Uh, we look at the, the data for the day. Uh, we, we work out where we are and what needs to be done uh, that day. Uh, we share it with, with cabinet colleagues when, it's, when uh, it, we need to get to a decision. Uh, if cabinet approves, that, that, that then goes to uh, to the devolved assemblies, to the devolved administrations, uh, to we, we, to the opposition uh, parties who, who, with whom we've been working very closely, and uh, we then, uh, once we've all got to a place where uh, we're confident we got that we're in the right place, we we go public with it, and and so tomorrow, uh, I'm hoping that uh, we'll get to a, a state where uh, we can announce further steps forward, uh, further measures in 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 step two. Of the roadmap, and um, uh, you, you've heard a bit of, uh, already about um, uh, retail, about schools. Uh, we hope there will be a little bit more uh, to come as well. Uh, but it, it all depends on uh, fighting that virus, uh, following our common sense, and uh, and uh, uh, making sure that uh, we we stay alert and, you, and everybody knows what the, the critical things are. We can't, we can't take these steps forward uh, if, the, if, there is a, if the infection rates uh, start to go up again and if the R goes up again. I think everybody's got that. Well, um, I, I thank you, Prime Minister, and um, thank you for taking so many questions. We've covered Not quite a broad waterfront. Uh, your track and trace proposals, uh, I think the salient points that I would take away about speeding up testing, uh, educational inequalities arising from the COVID crisis, the unequal effect of the crisis on women, particularly women with children, uh, the dividends point raised by the Chancellor, which seems to be a lacuna in the business support uh, uh, package. Um, and raised by, raised by Mel. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, did I say somebody else? I apologise. Um, but well, you promoted it as a Chancellor. But anyway. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, the um, um, but I mean, I think this all underlines how much I think this has been of great benefit um, 
for the public to understand um, what is going on and for the public to see Parliament uh, holding you to account on these matters. I really do think it would be a benefit if we could see you again before the summer. Results. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I could see you. I could see you. Were, you were working your, your well, yourself up to say that again. Uh, Bernard, I'm just going to repeat the the answer yeah. I gave at the at the very beginning, which is that we're working flat out to defeat coronavirus, to get our country back on its feet. Um, uh, I think it is very important. I have enjoyed this session. I think it's very important for uh, us to try to. Uh, and, been difficult though some of the questions have been. Uh, I think it's very important for us as parliamentarians to to share uh, uh, ideas and to discuss things together in the way that we have in the last uh, 90 minutes or so. Uh, the trouble is it does take a, a huge amount of, 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 of sharper time, of preparation time, uh, but we will do what we can, Bernard. We will do well, what I we can. just point out the questions where you've hesitated and decided to go away and think are some of the most positive answers you've given in some respects, and that's where we want to help. And uh, I hope that you will come back soon. Okay, well, that's what's well, that's, 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 for being thank you very much. disciplined and so helpful in this session. Thank you. Order, thank you. Order. Thank you.